Russell Perot was my boss at Vintage Books, where I worked for 10 years. Um, he was an incredibly generous, brilliant book publicist, um, sort of irreverent, funny, quick, um, kind. He just wanted to play. I don't think I've ever met someone who was such a puppy in human form, which by the way, can be incredibly irritating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he had an obsession with old musicals and, and books and movies and culture and this sort of insatiable thirst for it. Um, and we were dear friends. It's one of those work relationships where you become friends, but also yeah, that friendship really surpassed their work relationship because it obviously continued. I quit vintage almost 13 years ago. Um, and he died in 2019. Um, and he was one of those people who was incredibly inappropriate, but you loved him anyway. Um, and he just had a lot of energy and he was a wonderful person. And we had this friendship where I describe it in the book as being sort of, we switched roles as they do in experimental theater. You know, one of us would be the parent, one of us is the brother, one of us is the wife, the boyfriend, the daughter, you know, and it was just, um, we were a team and he also, uh, had a, a partner, um, and also, of course, has a family, you know, as a mother and a nephew and other people. Um, but for me, he was uh, my dearest friend and a huge part of my life. And I think we were also each other's primary advocates. Um, the first person that I think the other one or one of the first people the other one would call when something either horrific happened or something marvelous happened um, or for gossip. <laughs> Yeah. So kind of like, what do they call it? Like a work husband? I know. I just feel like that sort of, I don't even know how I feel about that phrase. When it applies, it just sort of feels too small for, for him a little bit. Because I do feel like I had other people that I, you know, I worked in publishing for 12 years and I had other people that I would describe as my work wife, my work husband, my work sister. Um, Russell was a little more part of the bones. But it's weird because I think that part of the book is struggling with the pressure almost to prove the closeness of it because I'm not a blood relation. So I never really – so it's it's a lot of the book is much as I guess you know Truth and Beauty was. That was something I really looked to um, or any kind of story about a friendship is you're, you're just trying to give it shape and then mourn it. You know, but normally – or not normally, but in the past for three collections of essays uh, – I've trafficked in the service of humor and the service of sort of, you know, t making that funny. Um, and this is a little bit different. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's also, I mean, it does have its, its great lines and its funny moments, but it is a natural question to ask you as somebody who has previously written humor and is kind of known for being a wit and a funny person and, bringing a bit of levity and lightness to people through her books to have to write about grief and loss and to write about someone and something so personal and so painful. What was the difference? Mm. I have to imagine it was maybe a bit more unpleasant, a bit harder or no. <laughs> uh, well, I think the key word there that I would focus on is have to. I didn't have to. You know, I did it voluntarily. Nobody asked me to do this. And so in a way I've made my bed. <laughs> but I think that the it feels the same. It's just that you're tackling it's basically the math is the same in terms of I have the same observation, same brain, same cerebral cortex that is transferring experiences to my brain, same thing that's processing them, but the conclusion is different. So I guess a, a sort of relatively obnoxious thing to say is what I used to do or, or will do again with humor writing is occasionally when I was editing it, I would know something was good if I still laughed at a couple of my own jokes. Because mostly right. you stop after a while, as you well, you probably never should start. <laughs> but, you know, eventually, you know, there's a couple of little like, you know, titters. You're like, <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And it, so it was the same process, but it was crying. <laughs> so there are a couple of lines in this book that I had tremendous difficulty getting through for the audiobook, for instance. Um, I mean, I can see, repeat them in isolation. There's a part towards the end where I'm wondering if everybody, all of us, all of us, all the people who were his friends and his loved ones, as they're called, I say, were we all the wrong people for you? You know, it's that, that, and I had a lot of difficulty reading that out loud. But uh, what's funny about it is if it was humor, I would never in a million years <laughs> go on a podcast and start just sort of giving you a bullet pointed list of all the stuff that I found funny <laughs> about my right. own writing. Right. But it, but I this is sort of new territory for me. So maybe I don't know enough uh, to know how obnoxious it sounds to say that there are a few lines that, that still get me choked up in the book. So it's interesting that you say that about the audiobook process and reading your own work, especially a work this intimate, and it's about grief. I had this experience where I was alone in the studio with the producer of the audiobook, oh, and you're yeah. reading you're reading this thing basically to them. Like there's the it's guy in the booth. It's like a kidnapping situation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like it's also like you're getting choked up, and it's like this yeah. very intimate emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And then there's just this dude who's like the engineer who's like sitting there like, like that's good. Yeah, yeah. Was you it, mispronounced probably again. <laughs> Learn how was to it, speak. <laughs> but was there any was there any like awkwardness? Like did you feel that where you're like, wow, this guy's hearing this story? And, well, uh, it was a it was a gal and a guy. Uh but yeah, I did um a couple of times uh she had a theater background, so it was kind of funny. So some of the there's a lot of Sondheim references a little bit of Gershwin in this book. Um, and so I think she really latched onto that. Uh, she seemed to really like those parts. Um, but yeah, no, I think I actually got her a couple times, which is good. Oh, good. I feel like, I, feel like I, I like, I really nailed her <laughs> a couple yeah. of times. So the most difficult part was, you know, what happened with Russell. Um, maybe this is a good way to get into sort of uh, what happened without really getting into or spoiling the book. But um, I saw him think, a few days before, a few nights before he died, we had dinner together. And so I tell the story of that dinner and what was said during that dinner in the book. And uh, there's, I tell it once, or I mention it once, and then I touch back on it later on in the book in more detail. And there's one line where I wrote something like, uh, I'm sort of dreading, I, I can't even paraphrase myself right now. That's not, not a good sign. But I say something about dreading telling the following part of the story because I frankly might be compelled one day to read these words out loud. And so when I actually had to do it in the audiobook, that was, that was pretty tough. And she sort of raised an eyebrow at me <laughs> from, yeah. from the other side of the glass. <laughs> well, you know yourself, I mean, right. And yeah, I, I have, you know, similar, a similar experience of loss. A friend of mine died of suicide when I was uh, younger, when I was 20, so also young. hanged himself. I mean, that's the method of suicide that Russell uh, took as well. And it is a particular kind of grief I found. And I'm curious to know if you feel the same way. I've lost other people. I've lost grandparents. I've lost pets. Me uh, too. Yeah. And suicide grief hits different. Is that the case for you? Yes. Well, I'm so, I mean, it's It's strange. I was about to say, I'm so sorry about your friend, and it sounds almost pat or flip, but just only because we have abused the language so much and we, we, we're all out when it counts. So I am very sorry about your friend um, still, and I'm sure you are still. I think that there's the mystery element that's that's overlaid to the grief where, but it, it's important, I think, to differentiate the mystery element and trying to get to know them better. Um, not because you didn't in real life, but just, you know, uh, real life. <laughs> you didn't when they were living. Oh, wow, that was a slip. Um, <laughs> everything since has not been real. <laughs> but, but I, but, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it to do it to examine your own grief. It's the human condition. It's how you express missing people. Um, I hope people uh, think about the experiences that they've had with you or with me when we're no longer here. But it's different than thinking you could have done something, which is the sort of common guilt that's laid over uh, a suicide. And 
I in the in the end at the end of the day, I'm obviously not an expert. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not should not be doing TED talks about this. Um, but I also like also can't be alone at the same time <laughs> with the kind of loss I experienced. So I know other people, if they've known people who are close to them to know that they've gone on and off medication, that they've had previous attempts, that they've confessed to different sort of ideations. That's a real actually, did you know, kind of situation, like what, what happened, what finally broke. And that's really important to talk about. Uh, but for me, I sort of tend to bristle at that reaction or that feeling from other people or even within myself. Cause I think like, I don't have the ego to think I could have stopped this to think I could have psychically known this was going to happen. And like what chained a 52 year old cogent man who works out a lot, by the way, to like a radiator, <laughs> like get him to not do this. You know, I, I can't, I can't, you know, so it's this strange balance where you don't feel guilt necessarily, or I don't feel guilt. Um, but I just wish I knew more and I wish I had gotten to say goodbye, but sometimes that feels selfish too. Yeah. I think like, I think you, you wrote something, you even say it in the book, this question of, did you know that people will sometimes or often ask yeah. about suicide loss where you're like, Hey, if I had known, if I had known clearly, I would have done something. Uh, I know. But the thing is, is I would, I, I would have encouraged them to get help. I would have, um, you know, been in touch more frequently than I was. Obviously when you work with someone for 10 years, for eight hours a day, you're never going to be that close again, if, unless you're, I mean, he's not even that. I think I saw him you know, he would go home on weekends. It's not like he would never see his partner during the week, but like I saw him a tremendous amount. I mean, I, uh, during that time. And once I quit, obviously not as much. Um, but you know, yes, I would have made more of an effort checked in, you know, but also you can't, can't really make somebody get help. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I wish to me, the, I, again, I'm not an expert in this. You'd have to ask somebody who knows the rates and stuff like that. But I think that the only thing I can think of that is helpful is to talk about it, to talk yeah. about it, because it is a massive mental health crisis. Um, and so to tell every story, it is much detail as, as you're comfortable telling. But and so that more people, but but individually, I don't know what I would have done for him specifically. Yeah, I think I found myself in the aftermath of your friend. Were you, you, know, you were both 20? He was 21. I mean, yeah, we were young. I mean, we had been yeah, on both. a semester abroad. We were kids, you know? And so yeah, and you think you, you think you know everything. And I was just, I think in the aftermath, I was looking back at it and I was kind of like using the benefit of hindsight to piece things together and then telling myself I should have seen things better. Sure. Uh, but that's true for absolutely every moment of your life. And what are you going to do? Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I think it's changed me in certain ways where I have friends who have had either depression issues or very bad addiction issues that I think in the past I've glossed over it a little more. And I look at that. I look at it a little bit differently. Do you know what I mean? I'm more attuned to those friends, not because they're suicidal, um, but because I just want to be more attuned to people in general. Yeah. I think that's what grief can do and loss can do and any kind of trauma can do. I think where I get frustrated sometimes is when I think about myself and how attuned I am, say to suicide loss, like somebody loses somebody to suicide. I'm always like, Hey, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's a kind of a human thing where we tend to be more compassionate towards those who have suffered similarly. I guess that's natural. I think my frustration is like, I wish I were more compassionate to just like everybody and I didn't have blind spots. And yeah, but also the do. thing is you can't, I, I feel like, um, I like to think an ideal version of, of my particular life and my particular vocation is that all of my exasperation and frustration with humanity and all of the sort of uh, knives I throw at it, that'd be great if that was just isolated to my writing. I feel like that happens with musicians where they, you know, you hear these like sort of metal bands or like the, the you know, you should listen to an interview with the people in Rage Against the Machine. They're like pussycats. Do, do you know what I mean? Or right. Chuck Palahniuk or Bretty Snellis. 
lovely guy. You know what I mean? And I feel like it would be nice if that was true. And then I walked around, you know, off duty as um, basically a sort of oracle of love and light. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. Come I on. don't think that's true. <laughs> no, but it's not. But that's, but this is why we miss people. And this is why we're imperfect at missing them. Do you know? I mean, Russell was not one note. I am not one note you know, we're fallible. Um, and so I think it's okay. It's just that, uh, in the book I mentioned at some point, not wanting to become more human for this experience and saying that, you know, whatever level of human I'm at is fine. This is fine. I don't need to be more. I don't need my horizons expanded by the depths of grief and loss and mourning. Thank you. Um, but the truth is, is they are expanded whether or not I like it or whether I like it or not rather. Um, and I am a, a little more sensitive to people. I mean, I, they still drive me crazy. I don't like I don't <laughs> like most of them, but I can actually watch them and and figure out when to worry about them a little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you talk about suicide and the uniqueness of suicide grief. And there's a line that I noted in your book where you say it's a manner of death so frightening we give it back to the dead as soon as it happens, unhanding it like hot coal. Uh, I think that there is something frightening about receiving news of somebody dying this way. It scared the shit out of me when I was young because I had never known anybody who took their own life before. I hadn't known very many people who had died at that point, though I had known some. Uh, and I had known, I mean, a child, one of my friend's little brothers died when I was young. So I'd see, I had, I have stood over a coffin at that point and seen oh. like a, a dead nine-year-old, you know, like yeah. it was not something that was total. that. Yeah, it's not pleasant Horrible. and it was not totally new to me, but like the suicide loss uh, of my friend scared me way worse. How did it scare you? I think it was that it was like, oh shit, this is really possible. Uh, part uh, of it was a they, function they, of you. That this is an option. This is an option. Yeah. Yeah. Did, yeah, did, yeah, did you yeah, have a similar you feeling? Did you? Yeah. Well, my feeling is I think there are doses that we all have without being depressed. Um, or clinically depressed. Um, everyone should look around at me depressed <laughs> considering the state of the world. Uh, but no, I, the way I sort of described it in the book is that feeling of just knowing that something is an option, knowing that there's like another door to your apartment, another room to your home is just sort of a shock. Um, and it's not always a delight. So I feel like often people will have it. I'm not alone in this. And that feeling of sort of physical fallibility, if you're, standing on the subway platform and the train comes rolling through and you're not thinking, Oh, I hope no one pushes me. Although you should think that and take a healthy step back on behalf of the <laughs> MTA. Yeah. But also you think, Oh God, you know, don't jump this tiny little thing. It's like, what if I jump? That's insane that I can jump. If you ever go to a monument in Europe, there's this sort of a freestanding elevator that juts up the middle of Lisbon. And at least when I was there, I don't know, there were no guardrails whatsoever. You know, I'm like, this is insane. This thing is a monument and a tourist attraction partially for its height. And there's nothing, <laughs> nothing to stop anyone. And so I feel like then you find out that someone in a very non-jokey way did this. And there's this sort of betrayal that they took this option. They're like, I thought we had agreed that we were all going to muddle through this shit together. <laughs> And I think that's where some of the anger that people feel comes. I mean, most people I think who go through a very pronounced anger stage have really sort of, it's not that complicated. It's just that it's, it's because they have children together uh, and they're left with that because they're left with the financial burden because they're left with living half their lives, the mortgage, the business, you know, something that they're saddled with that's actually quite concrete. Um, but I have very little anger towards Russell, but I do have that, that fright that you're talking about. I did have that when I first found out where I thought, oh, wow. I didn't know that, that you had access to that room. I don't want access to it, to be clear, right. but yeah. I didn't know that you were walking around with the sort of keys to that. And that's really scary. Well, and I think, you know, for people who maybe are inclined toward creative projects and imaginative exercises uh, like a suicide grief i think plays on that a lot as well it's impossible to lose somebody to suicide and not game it out 
right? You're just yeah. sitting there. You're sitting there going like, "Oh my God, yes. what were those last moments like?" And it's really morbid, but yes. it's very human. I think. How well, can you morbid not? Because you think you can't help but put yourself. I think the other difficulty is understanding what percentage of it, and you'll never know. But what percentage of it? I mean, a lot of it is is free will. So I think that gaming also happens because you're thinking almost you can't help but superimpose your yourself because you're you know afraid of your own you're confronting mortality and you're something that's going to happen to you as well you can't help but superimpose yourself and think oh what if this happened to me as if it happened to them which in some ways it did in some ways it didn't right you know and you're like well this won't happen to you you know you won't have these few minutes that you are aware of uh most likely um but it's a you know, I mean, having said all that, the strange thing for me about Russell is that, and the, the reason why it's so hard for me even to still process it is he was so funny. So there's this sort of dual cylinder in the book of me and of his lines that are not mine <laughs> um, in the same engine. And it's still feels almost false to talk about it in such serious terms, even though the topic is so serious. And I do understand what happened. And I am not a complete moron. <laughs> and I know that he is not stuck in the bathroom with a bad oyster. But like, are we sure? Do you know, <laughs> there's just a little part of me that never got past square one with this. But I've also grown to accept that that is how I grieve. And that is okay. And it will always be that way. And that's in a way, a way of keeping him with me. You know. Well, that's a lot of what this book is about. And I feel like to just extend the conversation about the particular nuances of suicide grief as its own individual thing, I look back on my experience of it and believe pretty firmly that I had PTSD. And oh, yeah. There's that. What happened? Well, I just, I, <laughs> I couldn't sleep for like weeks after it happened. I never got therapy. I still haven't gotten therapy. I wrote well, you books. You were also so young. I do think it's a different ball game. And you were at a really, really bad age. I mean, for anything bad to happen, I think, really, because you think you know everything. You know, you said you'd just gotten back from being abroad. And you're like, oh, if America only knew what the whole world thought of it. <laughs> right. I'm so worldly. <laughs> I've right. been to another English speaking country. <laughs> you know? I have seen shit. I have seen some shit. Um, yeah. And I feel like so that that weird feeling of like you have total purchase on humanity and the sort of inner workings of it. And you know yeah. how people are. And then to be brought up short by the fact that you are a teenager and a child and you don't know anything. Anything. You know, it was it was like you know, as we were to literally when you are a child, you don't know anything and then be, and when you're my age, you know, and you're in your 40s and you're like, "Oh gosh, okay, this is happening." But 20 something, I don't even know where you put something like this information when you're so young. Yeah, it was a weird juxtaposition. We had But been, you saw, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You started to say so you felt you had PTSD. I'm not a doctor, but No, but it, how I, did that how did that manifest, I guess? Well, I just like sleeplessness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like a lot of, I guess, like ruminating, some depression, certainly. Yeah. I don't know. Just like it just really shocked the shit out of me. And I'm wondering, like, do you s see things similarly for yourself? I mean, different age and different stage of life when this yeah. happened to you. So you processed it differently. But I kind of sensed when I was reading, I was like, I think maybe there's some post-traumatic stress disorder. We should also say that you had a break, like part of this book details a break-in, your apartment got broken into, it's some precious, you know, jewelry that's very precious yeah. to you was stolen. So you yeah, lost not that, not hope diamond level, but yeah, some stuff. <laughs> but some stuff that really had deep meaning to you and maybe took on even deeper meaning in, in the wake of Russell's death. Mm -hmm. And then there was the pandemic, which is also very much what this book is about. So there were these kind of coalescing life events and like like in the case of the pandemic like a mass trauma that yeah, were that was not my own <laughs> yeah but i mean it affected you and so i guess like it seemed that way to me and i think like it's a lot to bear life is a lot to bear for us all but this you know particular but it also time gave period. the i mean as a human being having a burglary you know i left the house for an hour uh <laughs> 
I left the house for an hour and it's, it's this part of the story. I just, I, I almost, I gloss over it. The way I put it in the book is luck is a dirty word when you're out of it, because I don't even know what to say still about the following, which is I left the house for an hour to buy paper towels, very important. Um, and to get an x-ray, I'd like hurt my hand. So I had to get an x-ray of my hand and I knew I would be getting an x-ray, which means for the cheap seats in the back, I took off all my rings <laughs> and left these rings that I wear every day <laughs> and have for years in my house. And in that hour is when all my jewelry was uh, stolen. Someone crawled in through my bedroom window, left their dirty boot prints on my bed, uh, smashed some stuff and took all my jewelry. And then exactly really down to it's within a couple hours it was in the evening uh so that was july oh, excuse me june 27th russell died july 27th exactly a month later he died and so as a human being this was not the greatest time of my life i would not recommend this experience <laughs> uh to others considering it uh but as a writer of this book um yeah, I don't know if this sounds really craven, but um, or just dark, but fortunate. Fortunate in the fact that it gave me a structure for the book and it taught me a lot about grief and quick, in, in sort of, it was like a boot camp. Um, and it gives a suspense to what is not a suspenseful story normally. So normally a grief memoir or anything like that let me spoil it for you. The, the ship sinks. Okay. <laughs> like, you know? um, and this has a little bit of a mystery to it as I try to hunt for the jewelry. But of course, psychologically, part of the reason I make some stupid decisions um, or just sort of wild decisions with a lot of bravado about trying to get the jewelry back um, without a lot of uh, thought to my own personal safety it, it is the grief. That is my form of magical thinking. It's not uh, carrying around a teddy bear he used to own. It's um, feeling like if I can get back some of the jewelry, I can truly get him back. And I didn't think that in a literal sense. I didn't think that he would come rising up like a hologram and follow me around. Uh, if only I got a necklace that didn't even belong to him on a side note <laughs> back in my possession. Um but I did feel in the way I put it in the book is that it would stop the bleed of loss. It was too much. And it's, you know, about what you can control, you know? And so yeah. I was given this thing as much as more, you know, and the sort of extra layer taken away from me in the form of the jewelry. I was also given something that was still on this planet that I could get back, which a lot of people don't have when someone dies. So it's this weird mixed blessing. What happened? Yeah. It kind of adds like a detective element yeah. to the book. Yes. It's uh, a weird hard boiled section. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I get it. And it makes a lot of sense on the page. And it also made me wonder, like from a writerly perspective, and this is kind of an odd, I mean, it's not an odd question, but it's, uh, it's writers will get it, but it's a little Everyone bit. Everyone else is going to think I'm a monster. What is it? <laughs> yeah. I just know just, it. What is it? Uh, well, just how, how soon, <laughs> how soon after all of this happened, did you decide to write a book or did you think to yourself like, this is going to be a book? And I'll add to that, that earlier when you said, you know, hey, look, I didn't have to write this book. I chose to write this book. Fair enough. But there are certain things I think that happen to us as human beings where if you didn't write about it, like, what, really? It's You're my just gonna... testament. It's my testament to what happened. I mean, could you really have just proceeded with the next funny collection of essays? Do you know what I'm saying? Like you sort of, maybe you sort of did have to write it if you're going to ever. Mm, that's a good point. I didn't. Yes, of course. But you also don't want to um, knock out some cathartic experience that happens to be in your personal way as a writer or as an artist and then sort of uh, abuse a readership with that until you get back to what you need to do. So I'm always very conscious and I am of uh, when it comes to essays, of course, the question is what's confessional, what's not. It's not that different for this where you're like, I'm conscious of entertaining people and sometimes entertaining people means upsetting them <laughs> and making them cry, you know, and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I thought after the burglary, I started taking notes. I thought, this is going to make for a doozy of an essay of some kind. 
But again, even that, no matter how no matter how extreme the experience is, where is the root system? What is the point? Where is the sort of universality? What am I trying to say? Um, which is, I believe, what has always separated what I do from a diary entry um, uh, or an episode of a sitcom, you know? <laughs> and so at least that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, and so I I thought – so even the burglary didn't come out as, oh, wait till they get a load of this, you know? Um, and then after Russell – I don't actually totally remember that time period so well. So I don't know when I really decided to have this be more of a mercury spill collecting bigger and bigger blobs, you know? Um, I don't I don't know. I don't know. But at some point, it was just going to be an essay about the burglary. I think that was floating around. Uh, partially, frankly, to uh, – I was uninsured and I wanted to get a little bit of money to buy some jewelry. I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's a real practicality to to all of this that people don't talk about. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know when there was some sort of fulcrum moment that that tipped over into it being a full length book. You know, I do think that some of it, quote unquote, poured out of me. But anything that pours out of you will you'll get a clot soon enough. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry yeah. about it. It won't be long. So so it's like, it sounds like a jerky kind of thing to say, to be like, oh, this whole thing, like the nonfiction just poured out of me, this story or for fiction. It's like, oh, my characters were just speaking to me. I'm like, not for long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they said. Yeah. You know, like eventually you're going to have to help things along. Um, well, yeah. So yes, Or, or, it, it, or what, what pours out of you? Like I've had this experience anywhere. It's terrible. Like, it's terrible. You're like, okay, this needs a lot it's of work. Terrible. Back, it needs to go back in, back in the ocean. Yeah. Putting the ocean in a paper cup. Yeah. So something else that this book is, I mean, this book is about many things. It's primarily about your love for your lost friend and the relationship that you guys had, but it's also about this, you know, this burglary and there's kind of like reclamation project that you undertake to try to track down the lost jewelry like via ebay and some sleuthing it Thank is you. about the yeah it is about the time that you spent working as a publicist at vintage yeah. for a decade which is an interesting and like i think very instructive career choice and career experience for somebody who has subsequently gone on to make her living publishing books like i'm kind of envious of it like oh yeah that's a great thing to do if you want to have some success as a writer of books is to understand the business from the inside out go figure uh, uh i wouldn't recommend it but uh, yeah yeah well i don't know i think you learned a lot and i think it served you in many ways well i mean that's my take on it anyway and the other thing that i picked up on as i was reading the book was this kind of elegiac note, like obviously elegiac in the friend sense and you know your relationship with Russell, but also elegiac for a time in publishing that was different uh, and maybe so you know sort of a uh, an expression of heartbreak over what has become of publishing. And I think this gets to the heart of Russell's heartbreak too, right? I mean, his professional life, and his experience as a very good book publicist in an industry that was kind of crumbling around him, that was traumatic for him. And I think maybe you, you, you understood that intuitively while he was still here, but it's one of those things that maybe clicked into focus more after he died. Yes. I'm, I'm happy you asked about it too, because I feel like when I was writing the book, I had the sense of concentric circles of loss, not necessarily in terms of impact, um, or profundity, uh, cause that would just be Russell. Um, but almost head count <laughs> where I'm like, well, there's no one around for the burglary. So that's ground zero <laughs> except for the cat, <laughs> um, who d did nothing <laughs> useless creature. You could have hissed. Maybe there was Shouldn't a hiss. Have had her declaw. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but no, um, and then you have Russell, you have this one loss of this one person. And then in my mind, you have the publishing industry and then you have COVID and then you have the world. So it, it, to my mind, it just, it, it's sort of this quiet structure to the book that I don't even think anyone would pick up on if I didn't tell them. I think I didn't do a very good job of it, but it's sort of how I was personally thinking of it while I was writing it. So you've hit upon an entire like stratosphere that <laughs> um, I do like to talk about, which is 
you know, this lamenting that things used to be better in whatever industry you work in is, is, is such a cliche, right? Oh, things used to be better. Like, what do we, you know, like, oh, all these publications are folding just in the past month. If you think about what's folded, what's, you know, uh, like the internet is dying and we used to think the internet was going to kill everybody. I mean, it's the same thing with like, you know, BNN was the big bad monster and then Amazon came along and now everyone's like, oh, ye old local BNN, you know? I mean, it's just like a completely <laughs> right. like, um, I mean, not quite, but I think that, so, so I tried to sort of really parse out, tease out that nostalgia that we both felt that, of course, it's easy to feel in book publishing, like, ah, oh, no one reads, there's, you know, no, no outlets, you know, the, when I quit and started publishing my own books, I was very conscious of the fact that the suggestions I was making to my own publicists who would then work on my books were insane. I, you know, I'd be like, hey, do you think of sending it to the, you know, the Times Picayune or the Star Tribune? Or what about the New York Sun? What about, you know, these these things that don't exist? It's not even that the sections don't exist. The whole thing doesn't exist anymore. And so without trying to sound like an old man who's like, you know, Ugh, when I was your age, I used to walk uphill both ways in the snow. Because right. um, there's a danger of that in, in the arts. I thought something really did happen to Russell and something really did happen to books where it was like boiling a frog, where it was just the internal pressure um, to basically be responsible for a department of people who he cared about so much, as inappropriate as he was. You know, in the book, I, I mentioned that he spent his spare time fighting for all our raises, you know, um, to keep everybody employed, to keep the authors happy, to keep the agents happy in a world in which you're sort of negotiating with a magazine to like maybe mention the book in the back where they used to be on the, the, the person you were talking about used to be on the cover. Um, and that pressure, that sort of differential was really difficult to use a sort of uh, very obvious analogy. I remember once being in a restaurant <laughs> in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, and it was like negative 30. And this restaurant had just put in a new glass window right next to the fireplace. <laughs> and as the temperature dropped, uh, all of a sudden I heard this crack and I looked over and it was like the day after tomorrow and this crack went right through the glass and the glass shattered Oy. because the temperature difference <laughs> between the outside and the inside, the glass just exploded. And without sounding too creative writing 101, this is what happened to my friend. And so it seems like a small thing to say really work. I mean, I think he had a lot of other issues, personal issues. Some I get into the book, some I don't. I don't want to speak for his relationship with his partner, who's a lovely human being. Um, but you know, there were there was trickiness abounded, as it does for all of us, as well as being someone who was approaching middle age, which is difficult, I think, especially for a lot of men. Um, and it was really a lot of it was the work. It was it was the fact that he could feel his own futility, and he was really unhappy and the thing that was so heartbreaking is it, it the unhappiness was coming from a source that used to make him so happy i was gonna say he was and he was so, so good happy. and he was he so was good at it so good at it in a way where i did not have a sense that there was such a thing as like a flack or that uh publicity was looked down upon or that it was inferior to editorial somehow in fact i had the kind of reverse snobbery I thought, you know, we are just as well read, but we get to read stuff that's already at least been filtered through like this gauntlet of a slush pile or, or agents. Um, and like the price for all this is that we have to deal with authors' egos, uh, which an editor doesn't quite have to in the same way. Uh, but, and we're working on so many more books and we are also outward facing. We know how the world works. We talk to media. We can actually make people read. It felt, I don't mean to sound like a literacy advocate, but that's how pure sort of his love was for books is that I can make like a magical power. I can turn around and make this world read what I want it to read. Well, yeah, and there's like, a, there's a, a line in the book. I, I apologize for interrupting, but it was like, no, it's fine. I'm just sort of waxing about how great he was at his job and he's really not employable right now, but <laughs> <laughs> he was really good at it. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you talk about how like he could take like some obscure 
debut or some like yeah. work in translation or whatever that nobody was even covering and like he could convince somebody not only to cover it but to also hold like a four-day symposium yes he did <laughs> like that where- a couple of times he did that or or he found anniversary editions so it would be the kind of thing where you know vintage obviously paperback uh he would it wouldn't be just up to the when the rights reverted back to the house or uh, the estate, he would really find, hey, it's the 50th anniversary of Chimua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. It's the 50th anniversary of Lolita. It was the like 20th anniversary of Who Will Run the Frog Hospital by Laurie Moore. And he's like, let's do something, you know? And I think that, uh, but he would also find, you know, the obscure and just sort of bang the drum. I think honestly, the reason a lot of people know about John Williams stoner could be attributed to him. There's a thousand things that it's, it's a lot of this book is a tribute, not just to him, but to people who work behind the scenes in the arts, because one of the things that happened, which is also very tragic is a lot of very prominent, respected, just totally beloved editors died soon after he did. Sonny Mehta died. Uh, a few months later, Susan Camel, Dan Meneker died a year later. Um, Susan Reedy or Carolyn Reed, excuse me. Um, all these people that if you work in publishing are sort of giants of our world and they all got obituaries as they well should have. And Russell did because he was a behind the scenes kind of person. And so when I wanted to be sort of glib while I was writing this book, I'd say, you know, he didn't, the times didn't give him a, give him a proper obituary you know, there's a couple of mentions online, but nothing really official, even like the local paper, wherever that would be, you know, where he's from. Um, and my joke is that I got 200 pages worth of real pissed that he did not get an obituary. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I thought there's such a not so fast vibe with this book, you know. Um, but a lot of that is, is yeah, feeling, feeling that pure love of someone who, who really... When people talk about loving books, unfortunately, it's been co-opted by like really sort of annoying people who would just as soon be, you know, reviewing avocado toast and scented candles (laughs) who are like, I just love books. It wasn't (laughs) like that. It was, it was, this is a true, a true advocate that was of great value in the world, but people only in retrospect, can you pick up a book in your house? And I can probably... By the time you pick up, let's say, if you picked up, if you're someone who reads, right, you're a reader, you have a library of contemporary fiction, or let's say fiction of the 20th century, and you pull out, by the time you get to like the fourth book, I can tell you Russell's connection to it. Does that make sense? Like, it it was just, it was, um, it's like the board game operation. You just touch a little bit and the whole board lights up. Yeah. I mean, that's, that really comes through in the book was how quietly influential he was not only on those around him, like he was, I feel like he had such a big impact on his coworkers, but he had a lot of impact uh, on authors, on authors vertically yeah. within vintage. And, you know, he got uh, people reissued. He got people back into print, got books on the bestseller list. Um, it's amazing what he did. And you talk to, I think that this space of book publicity is underexplored and it's so essential. It feels so essential to authors. I mean, you're you're at this nexus right now, right? I kind of related to your descriptions of this because I do feel like I'm witnessing people in this space that you describe. There's a line that I loved where you say, after the art is done, all that's left is the ego. <laughs> and this is where- Thanks for writer... having me on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> But this is this is the truth, right? We 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 spend all these years laboring, uh, you know, in our hovels wherever they happen to be. We write the book. We have to go through the process of finding a publisher sometimes, or there's a publisher waiting if we're lucky. Then we go through the editorial, and then we kind of wait. And there's this pre-pub, and then you get to this moment where the book emerges into the world, and that is where that's not the only place where, but it's the place where the publicist looms large in the author's life or more often in the author's imagination. They're imagining a publicist who might be there for them. Uh, <laughs> well, they're the caboose of the train, right? So anything that has gone right or wrong, um, but of course every author will find something wrong, uh, on the way, there is only one person left to blame <laughs> or one person left to uh, burden or 
um, desperately kiss the ass of, or just just you're sort of clinging uh, with sort of one pinky off the edge of this cliff, and the only person holding that pinky is your poor, beleaguered, incredibly overworked, underpaid book publicist who you should be grateful for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, at the same time, you can tell when someone's, if you ever go to dinner with somebody who used to be a waitress or used to be a waiter and like, I will think, oh, well, I have no idea. The kitchen must be backed up. You know, you have no idea and sort of have this incredible amount of allowance or respect for what they're doing. And the person who used to do the job is like, no, they're a bad waitress or they're a bad waiter. (laughs) Right. And so like, I tend to know, I've been really fortunate in that I haven't had somebody like I've had great publicists I haven't had of my own so I haven't had someone where I'm like but I have heard stories from other authors where they're like is this normal because I know they're overworked I'm like no they actually forgot to send out the galley mail (laughs) yeah that's bad (laughs) we don't like that (laughs) so luckily I've never had that but I I have heard some horror stories yeah it's well I I would bet that your publicists knowing your your publicists probably know that you used to be a publicist right wouldn't that be funny if I was like, no, I've kept it from them. <laughs> <laughs> everybody in New York, no, everybody the, the, in publishing knows that, everybody. What's funny is I like worked so hard to get it out of reviews and to get it to not be this sort of local girl makes good story where, you know, fourth book, it was still like something that is like some, you know, the first lines of a book in the New York, of a review in the New York Times about how I used to be a book publicist. And I'm like, show me the essay that's about book publicity. I'm so curious. (laughs) It's not in here. You know, it's just like, it's just that because you feel like you know me, uh, I get sort of screwed from both sides, which sounds like something I shouldn't be saying in a podcast, but um, (laughs) which is just, (laughs) which was like, just should be said, period. But, you know, where, you know, people think, oh, wow, she has all these connections. So you get the sort of uh, undermining vibe from the outside that sort of sneaks in occasionally you sort of carries in on a breeze um and then from the inside no one wants to look like they're covering their friends so they don't cover or take you seriously in the same way so i'm like wait this is this isn't fair (laughs) but i'm not asking for pity about it i'm just simply saying it's like a funny kind of thing that sort of happens and i'd worked so hard therefore to just get it out of the way to not mention it to not talk about it and then finally, uh, I was given the gift of the past, you know, two books. People didn't mention it. Humorist Sloan Crosley, novelist or essayist. Great. Wonderful. And so my response to that was to write a memoir about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this will be the final like, exorcism. Let's forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but this was really about, because I, I think because of all that, I didn't want to talk about it for so long because I felt it was interfering in the nature of the coverage and the kind of coverage and how people were absorbing my work that I had worked so hard on, like everyone else. Um, And now I felt like, wait, this is a huge part of my life. I'm not going to talk about what it was like, different stories that are both mine and Russell's and the publishing world and all of that stuff uh, for actually 12 years total, 10 at Vintage. Um, And then in a weird, very warped way, this gave me an excuse to talk about it. Well, I you know I think from the outside looking in, it seems to have served you well. I'm yeah, sure it's in not ways... like a nightmare. I'm just saying that there's it's not all it's cracked out to be. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I get like the whole like reductive thing where people and also that weird thing where it's like yeah you think it's helping me, but people on the inside are actually shying away because they don't want to seem like they're yes. playing favorites. So it can be yeah. kind of like a double edged sword. But... but it does help you understand. Honestly, the the what it does because after a while the media contacts like what who, the people I know who worked at certain places no longer work there. Like I said, half of them don't exist. What it does help is give you empathy that you should have had from the jump <laughs> um, with how to speak to your publicist. What is expected? Like, yes, have I asked? Oh, do we have any word from X Y Z major outlet yet? Because it's sort of irresistible to just ask, even though. It's not like they're keeping this information from me. I know that because I wasn't <laughs> keeping the information, to, you know, but I would never phrase it in a way that it was phrased to me sometimes, such as, you know, have you thought about sending this to the Today Show? Have you thought about sending this to Oprah? Where you just want to be like, never occurred to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> right. Thank you. 
Right. Yeah, here's the keys to the kingdom. I should actually right. give you my salary. You know, I, mean, I, just, <laughs> I don't know why I'm, it's, I feel false accepting it. Uh, but, I, you know, so you sort of know a little, that's the best thing it's given me is the ability to, I mean, my expectations are still just as warped as every other author's, but how to phrase them is hopefully a little more sane and a little more appreciative. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like, I mean, just outside looking in, like on your Instagram, I was, I was looking at these photos of your book launch party and I'm like, oh. <laughs> you seem glamorous. You seem glam. Ah! Like, Salman Rushdie is there and Graydon Carter. I mean, this is not the kind of book launch party that most authors would be able to put together. Oh, uh, well, uh, it, it was a, a freakish amount of work that, uh, um, <laughs> it was a lot of work to put it together, but it, I kind of liked the idea of an old school book launch party, but I really liked it. Um, and was willing to sort of write a, a tremendous amount of emails and, and wrangle a lot of cats um, to do it because I had this sort of feeling that it wasn't just for me, um, that it was for Russell. And I will, I will go ahead and compound the glamour and say that the, the launch party was at the Waverly Inn. And strangely, it wasn't just a coincidence. So it's not in the book, but the day I heard that Russell died, um, I heard it in the morning. And then I had plans to meet uh, my friend who was my editor at Vanity Fair um, for drinks at the Waverly, just a glass of wine or something. Um, and she knew, everybody knew pretty quickly what had happened. And I just sent her a text at like four o'clock. I'm like, are we still on? And I went because I just didn't know what else to do. Yeah, And she was so lovely to me and she was so, it's funny. She was the first preview where I feel like I, I mention in the book, the sort of strange unfairness that everyone else seems to know what's going to happen to you when you say you've lost somebody. Everyone else, when they say, I'm so sorry. And when they hear it's by suicide and when they know the relationship, everyone else seemed to have a real handle on it. And it's almost like being like the psychic detective in the show where, you know, you can solve everybody else's crimes, but then you, you know, walk down the creepy stairs in the basement and, <laughs> right. you know, I, I couldn't see it for myself. Um, and I remember seeing it in her eyes first and thinking, I'm in for it, you know? So it was a sort of a special place to have a tribute to him at a party that frankly, I, I just, I pulled out of the stops because I know he would have liked it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I get that. And I think like a lot of these people who were there know you, obviously, but also and they knew, knew him. him. They knew him. Yeah, they knew him. And um, yeah, he liked, he liked, he liked fun, rarefied things. And I know that makes him sound like a snob, but the snobbery was on behalf of authors. You know, he would be so irate if he felt that someone in an interview had asked them a question that he found beneath them. You know, he really worshiped them. Oh boy. Now um, I'm wondering, I'm like, that's, Oh that's no, 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 no. I mean, really you're fine. You're fine. Okay. You're good. Fine. Good. Thank yeah, you. Speaking of, of, of Salman Rushdie, it'd be like, so fatwa, <laughs> <laughs> is it so right. bad? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, right. you have to watch right. a lot of TV, right? You know, I, mean, I, I, just, I don't know. People ask wild questions. You're fine. <laughs> okay, good, good. I'm thinking of Russell now, like watching us have a conversation. It's hard. His presence, as you've rendered it on the page, I never met Russell, but I've met him in the pages of your book. And he comes across as uh, like kind of larger than life. He's like this great mensch and uh, wickedly funny. Something that you said earlier, I want to make sure we cover it, hmm. is the fact that he was so inappropriate. You've said this multiple times. We I all meant love it every time. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but the thing is, is that we live in an age where to be quote unquote inappropriate is often associated with like being a sinner, right? Or being cancelable or being somebody who doesn't get it. And yet I don't know a single person on earth who doesn't prize their most quote unquote inappropriate friend. Like not, not in an egregious or ugly way, though, I guess sometimes it can, you know, the, the whole point of an inappropriate sense of humor is that it tests boundaries. Yeah. And I don't know. I just, I have so well, much they're affection. they're human valves, right? Yeah. They're valves. Like they're, 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 they, but the danger with those people is they are so valuable. They're so, so they're valuable to society as a whole. You know, there's, these are the, uh, it's like a cousin of speaking truth to power. Um, just 
you know, in a more sort of lighter comical way. But the danger is just sort of assuming that they're like the Chrysler building, that, that they're just, they're just sort of always going to be there and that they can be that for you. You know, I mentioned my friends who, you know, have addiction issues before and I look back and think I could always rely on that person to go to this kind of party or take me here, or give me this or be up at four in the morning. But what is the price they're paying for my one Tuesday night a month? That's like that. Do you know? And it's just like, it's, and I feel like with Russell, he was too quick for his own good. One of my favorite things he ever said that's in the book. And I worry sometimes because when you write about someone, you forget all the stories that are outside the book or that's a danger. I've made a conscious effort to not do that with him. Um, but uh, he said at some point, my assistant walked in to this meeting and she wore very preppy, but very tight fitting clothes. And she uh, walked in, she sort of had this tight cardigan on. <laughs> um, and he looked up, up at her and he said, oh my God, it's like you walked into Talbot's and said, give me the sluttiest thing you have. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, 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 no. And afterwards, I remember I pulled her aside and I'll have you know, this is way before me too. This is just common sense. I was like, hey, hey, um, <laughs> he's funny. We love him. If he ever says anything that's really bothersome to you, Obviously, you can tell uh, the authorities, but you can also just tell me. I just want you to you know this is a safe space. <laughs> yeah, right. And like, I didn't need a movement for that. It's <laughs> just, just like, oh. Yeah. And um, she, I remember she was like, no, he's fine. He doesn't really have time. She goes, she, she said something. She's like, he's too busy for actual harassment. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean. Probably true. But I, th I think he just. So that's what I mean by inappropriate. I think the lines, once he started to get so unhappy at work. And I think things maybe weren't going, you know, as, as much as I'll say about it is that things weren't perfect at home, you know, but, you know, who amongst us cast the first stone, but like things weren't perfect at home. And I think that frustration, it's like he worked so hard. Where else was it going to come out? Do you know, he would come to the office at 7.30, 8 a.m. and stay so late. You know, he'd go to the gym after work and come back, you know, and so... The personality, that frustration has to come out somewhere. And I think the way I describe it in the book is that it had lost some of its sugar coating. Like the stories I'm saying now are kind of funny, but I think especially in the years when I wasn't there, um, you know, because I kind of grilled coworkers afterwards, you know, as if, as if it had been their fault, as if they had made a mess of this sort of transparently fragile person when they hadn't. Um, I'm like, what happened? Almost like something bad had happened on their watch. Like they should have been watching. Yeah. Um, and I got some uh, some reports, and I'm like, <sighs> yeah, that sounds like something I'd tell human resources about if I was someone else. Do you know? So, to be yeah. fair, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So it was, well, it was I think tough. it's well, work is work is tough. Like capitalism is tough. Corporate culture is tough. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it is. so happy we found both of our, <laughs> our, our joint epigraph. <laughs> Capitalism is tough. But it is. I, it, the, the pressures it brings to bear on people. And he had been there for how long? I mean, he has spent his whole career, his whole life. Well, 25 years, but I think not in a row. Or it was more than 25 years. It's more than 25 years. That's a great question. I should know the answer to that. I don't know. A long time. But a, a long time. And yeah. it's, uh, there's a lot of like big tectonic shifts and changes that were happening not all of which were good, which we've covered. And there were a lot of pressures I'm imagining coming down on him from above. And then he also was trying to advocate oftentimes for his employees, even though they might not have understood his affection for them as clearly as it was there. And I get it. You know, I think it's very, I think it's human. And then I think too, like there has to be space in life for people to make jokes, even jokes that might have a little bite to them. Hmm. I don't know. I, I hope kind of... so because the whole freaking book, you know, this is a, it's not being funny about suicide, but it is a funny book about suicide. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a way, and I worry, I worry about offending people. I still, as much as I say, you know, as much as this book is sort of a giant sort of piece of advocacy for 
mourning your friend and mourning friendship and, and a tribute to a friendship and just really the joy of it. You know, it's, I also, I still, of course, feel like there is a hierarchy to things. You know, if someone turns around and they will and says, you know, I am someone who's lost, I lost my daughter to suicide. I found her. And I find a lot of the things you say kind of flip and glib about suicide and how dare you put the jewelry in the same book or anything like that. Um, I think that's going to get to me because I think that there should be room for this book, but I know that it has to fight a little bit because it's not how we talk about suicide and it's not how we talk about grief normally. Well, who gets to make these rules? I don't know. That woman. <laughs> yeah, that woman. Well, because I think normally if you offend people who, you know, in the, I, I mean, I'm, this is all conjecture. You know, this is all my, my, you know, anxiety as an author coming out. Nothing bad has happened yet. Knock on wood. But I feel like, uh, you can play back this podcast after it does, but, <laughs> but the, but I feel like in the past it's been, you know, the slings of an, and arrows have been ones of, um, privilege or navel gazing or, you know, wit over substance or style over substance. Um, and I'm happy to like roll up my sleeves and have a fight with someone about that, you know, uh, without feeling like I might hit somebody who I'd rather hug. And this is different. Yeah. This is more yeah. personal. Like, yeah. in a well, way. it's more personal to a lot of people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll say this. I didn't have any sense of that. I, I didn't I, either. Otherwise, that's right. But I also feel like <sighs> I just... I want to respect that there's a lot of different kinds of this experience. The very nature of suicide is that it is like a horrific perfume from hell that smells slightly different on everyone. Yeah. So it's not just saying cancer and therefore you have as much knowledge as anyone else. Um, not that everybody isn't different, but you know, but suicide specifically, it's just people struggle sometimes overtly, sometimes inwardly, sometimes not at all. It's all ages. It, the, there are the means, the manner, the, it's such a horror show. So, but it's different on everyone. So people, you never know what the reaction will be. You don't, but you can't, I mean, I think you, you, you're coming to the, to the page in good faith and sharing your experience, yeah. which is yours to share in good faith. And that's the most you can ask of anybody. If somebody's going to try to grade things in that manner, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when it comes to like not permitting somebody to make a joke yeah. or not permit, you know, it's like people need to give people some space. And yeah. I think just a you little know, grace too, like a little, a grace little grace. To be like, is it, they're imperfect. And if they were perfect, there would be no book. So maybe sit down, but you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Well, I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this, and maybe you would disagree. I know we've talked about the kind of the ghost of Russell sort of like you know, sitting on your shoulder or looming over this conversation and like watching it like a ping pong match or something. But, uh, I believe he would be deeply, deeply moved by this book. I hope so. I think he would. I, I think he it would take actually take him a while to read it. It's very maybe. Lazy person. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he would. Okay. It's like, okay. oh, no, it's a trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think he might tell you that it took him a long time to read it. I think he would have read it. I think he would have been deeply yeah. moved by it. And I think he would have so. loved it. I think he Thank would have you. loved it. You did him, you did him justice on the page. Uh, I guess like a, it's like a twofold way to end. The first is like, it's kind of like a trite question, but I feel like it's worth asking because when people are writing from a place of trauma, grief, they go through the whole hassle of making a book about it. It does change you. Does it not? Did it give you something? I, I don't want to like reduce it to like, oh, this was my catharsis and I'm all healed right. now. And, you know, but it does, <laughs> there is something in the process of writing that for me anyway, like did lessen the pain a little bit. It did give me something healing. Did you feel that going through this process of writing? Not during the process. During the process, it felt, and maybe it is like cleaning out your closet. You make more of a mess first to do that. Yeah. Um, 
I think during the process of it, it made everything a lot worse. It didn't feel like catharsis. It didn't, it felt like, um, extending things. You know, I definitely had a hard time when I wrote the last lines of the book. Um, because in some ways I'm like, now I say goodbye. And in some ways I thought, well, now we begin. Now we begin in earnest. I have delayed something. And now welcome to the Thunderdome. You know, I felt that. And now I feel like I just have something extra. Like I, a extra sort of assistance in, in dealing with it. But I don't, I have never really felt that way about writing. Um, and it's going to make it sound like I am not okay, but it's also how I work, which is that I just, every, especially with nonfiction, some somewhat with fiction, a little bit with cult classic, but like mostly with nonfiction, I just feel like I throw up. That'd be great if I just ended the sentence. I just feel like I throw up. I feel like <laughs> I throw up like a little shard of the actual experience. Like I shave off a little bit throw it out there it sticks and then it's sort of never mind again and it cycles and it makes things worse and it becomes sort of deformed so, <laughs> so it actually makes everything a little bit worse and deformed but it just but it's it's about what's worth it though you know before when i was talking about how i chose to do this you choose because it's worth the squeeze you choose because you think and this is probably the biggest the most difficulty I've ever had really choosing to do this because it risks, like I said, deforming or warping my personal memories of Russell and where I put him and separating him out from the book. And I, to be totally frank with you, I've had to almost like walk around like a mantra and be like, every author should walk around with the first one, which is I am not the book. <laughs> Say it all now. <laughs> It'll make you much nicer to your publicists and much more apt to uh, deal with criticism. If you remember that you are not the book. Um, but I had to also for this one, be like, Russell is not the book. He is not the book um, to make sure that it's sort of separated out. But at the same time, I'm happy that I, I think it's worth it that I did it. Um yeah, as a, as a tribute to him, but also as uh, a way of trying to get to something about grief, which is such a massive, um, permanent topic that that seems new, that felt new to me. Is it harder going on tour with this book? I know you're just beginning, but like doing it's press, to talking, talking <laughs> to people like me. Yeah, but I mean, like, did, have you been experiencing maybe even more anxiety than you normally would. Like I know all authors right before a book comes out experiencing, you know, some, yeah. some nerves, but to have a book like this come out, one that's so personal and that deals with such kind of uh, painful subject matter for you, is it extra? <sighs> it's like, I'm like, ask for me tomorrow and you'll find me a dead man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, um, yeah, I think a little, a little extra. I, I don't really think so yet, though, because I haven't had the experience of signing books for strangers yet. That's the thing. So speaking about him, speaking about him, uh, answering questions about him, about the book, feels like, you know, I, like I said, I described him as pathologically social in the book. He loved people. I describe him as puppy-ish. What better gift than to get him more people, even more? Right. You know, everybody, get, come to the party. <laughs> That's <know>? right. <laughs> it's a weird party. It's awkward. <laughs> it's got a light weekend at Bernie's vibe. <laughs> Sorry, that's so wrong. <laughs> but but, but, but actually, on. perfect. Yeah, but come on over, you know? Yeah. And um, so so in that sense, no, I I look forward to it all the more. I really do. Um, and I actually don't, so I just, I haven't, I don't even mind hearing people's stories or I haven't, but I haven't heard them yet. So traditionally what happens is because I do weirdly have some experience with this. So there's some track that's been laid by writing three books of narrative nonfiction. People come up to you. They're like, ah, oh, 
Well, when I was fired, when I volunteered, when I froze my eggs, when I was a bridesmaid at a wedding I didn't want to go to, you know, whatever it is, they have their parallel stories. And it's like you have held the microphone, the conch, whatever, and now it's their turn. And they just want to close the loop. You don't really have to do anything. So it's not this right. pressure. You don't. And so that's sort of, I think, this is sort of that writ large or writ more um, profoundly. That's what I sort of anticipate. People will tell me their stories. They will. And I want to hear them. It's not like a burden to hear them. It's, it, but it's more that I think I already have in place the ability to know why they're being told. You know, which is because it you did your job well. If you got into their brains with your book, it's like your voice was in their head. And it is true. It's a one-sided conversation. And now they can say their piece. Um, and I think it's important to let them. But I have no idea if doing that, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll be very lucky if I'm in a situation where that's so overwhelming that I can't do it anymore because there are just so many people who have bought the book and read the book, you know. We'll see. And are moved, but moved to share. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good problem to have. So last question, are you working on anything else? And it's fine if you're not, but I always ask people if there's another project in the works. I know. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a, yes, it's, it's a, a percolating fiction. Um, I'm actually pretty far into it, but we'll see what happens with it because Usually I find what happens is that it's very healthy and it's, I've recommended this to other for author friends or anybody really is when you're promoting something, have the other one like chain smoke a little bit. Um, not to be some sort of ambitious art monster, but just to psychologically protect yourself from the promotion part. So you're already on another planet. Uh, I have been bad about this this time. It's been too hard. I think that that's been too hard with this. It's too overwhelming it's too much of a gear change. Um, but so I do have a couple of things I'm working on. I just, or one big one. Um, but I think it's, it'll be tended to later. And is it m more like back to like the comedic It's slow an mode? album of ukulele music. You're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask but, me I mean, any of the questions about it. <laughs> yeah. But tonally. Yes, no, it's, to not, it's, not, it's not about grief. No. Yeah. It's not about grief. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Although right. who knows? Well, I think when things like this happen, it's like. We'll see if everything is from now on. I don't know. You never know. And yeah. uh, I think you can be both at the same time. This book is evidence of that, you know, Thank like you. sad and funny together to me is a lovely mix. That's like life, right? Yeah, and, of course. Uh, it's been great to talk with you. Congratulations you too. on this book. I wish you well on your tour. Thank you. And again, I'm really sorry uh, that all of this has happened. It's I really a, appreciate it, that. Thank you. 